I'm Mike Vine, for those who don't know me, uh, lead organizer last year, complete waste of space this year, um, and I'm here to introduce Nick. Uh, for those who don't know, I've been in the libertarian movement for a long time, proportionally to my life, since I was 13. Uh, and as long as I can remember, uh, Nick has been there. Uh, when I was a young libertarian, uh, before Ron Paul ever ran for president, uh, we had the Libertarian Party, we had Reason Magazine, uh, and Nick was there, and, reading, and I was reading his writing. Uh, I think most, most influential to me as I went to the meetups with uh, mostly old men in fanny packs and, and m young me, uh, Nick showed that uh, libertarianism could be cool uh, before any of us knew that it could. Um, he's gone on to continue to produce, to be a, a wonderful activist and communicator. Uh, we all know him well. Uh, we see him on Stossel. Uh, we see him through Reason TV, which he spearheaded on his own, uh, and he's been always been committed to the cause. I've never for one minute doubted that. Uh, just a little background, uh, Nick is currently editor of Reason TV. Uh, he has an MA and a PhD, a uh, very well-educated individual. He writes for the Daily Beast, Time Magazine, and his latest book uh, with Matt Welch is uh, Declaration of the Independence, um, How Libertarian Politics Will Change the World. Uh, as a side note, he's a big soccer fan, so if you don't see him on site, you know where he is. Without further ado, I'm very proud to present Nick Gillespie. Thank you, Thank you Mike. I, uh, I think that was a uh, great introduction. Thank you, I appreciate it. I think it was a roundabout way of saying that I am a fucking old man. So thank you, I've been around a long time. And when you see me, if you see me with a fanny pack, uh, let me tell you, it'll be a colostomy bag, okay? <laughs> I'm getting up there. So thank you very much, though. Okay, what I would like to do is basically, I wanna, I wanna talk for uh, hopefully like about 20 or 30 minutes and then have questions uh, and answers, uh, personal accusations, ad hominem attacks after that as much as possible. Um, and I'm going to, uh, before I get started, uh, what I'm going to talk about is why the libertarian moment is now uh, and what we can do to kind of speed up the momentum and make sure that it, we don't get uh, cop blocked uh, anywhere along the way. Uh, and before I start, I do want to thank Carla uh, Gorecki. I don't know, oh, there she is, Carla. Thank you so much. She has uh, lost her voice, from what I understand. I'm sorry, what are you, what are you, you're saying something about the Jews and the international banking conspiracy over there? I'm, okay. No, no, but uh, I want to thank Carla and all of the people at the Free State Project. And I know Jason Sorens, who is kind of like, uh, you know, in a way, we're all crumbs in his beard. Uh, he dreamed all of this, and it's kind of fucking great that he's around here and talking. But I want to thank Carla and Jason and everybody at the Free State Project, because you guys are really bringing something together here that is absolutely unique. And mostly because I've never taken a, a speech-giving class, which will be soon uh, become very apparent. Uh, but I want to thank you people for here. Um, and uh, when Carla finally got me to come up here, uh, which I've been trying to do and the scheduling didn't work, though, I, when I started thinking about, like, well, why did I want to come up here? And it's one of the things is you guys are the demonstration project, both at Porkfest and the Free State Project and everywhere you are. And I'm a, I'm a big Jack Kerouac fan. Uh, you know, I like uh, On the Road, and I like Jack Kerouac and William Burroughs and uh, The Beats and Neil Cassidy, my uh, sons are actually uh, named Jack and Neil uh, because you know this is the world that we should be living in where you go on the road and you have adventure and whatnot. And I was thinking when I was coming up here, what I want, the reason I wanted to be up here is because as Kerouac talks, uh, he has a great passage, an electrifying passage, which I won't do justice to, in On the Road where he says, you know, I wanna be uh, with, with the mad ones. The only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time, who burn, burn, burn like fabulous, fabulous, uh, fabulous yelling Roman candles exploding like spiders across the stars. Thank you for being here and thank you for doing what you're doing because that's why I wanted to be here. I wanted to see the yellow spiders exploding through the stars like Roman candles. So keep doing what you're doing. 
And uh, pro, pro tip, you can rarely go wrong by uh, complimenting your audience. By the way, you're also, I've never seen uh, such a, uh, never uh, seen such a pretty, handsome, and you know, fresh-smelling audience as well. So, all right. So let's get uh, let's get talking, and then uh, I'll shut up as soon as possible, and then we'll have uh, some Q and A, hopefully. But uh, you know, what I want to talk about is the libertarian moment is now. How many of you have been you know grinding, you know, pushing the rock up the hill, uh, you know, for you know 20 years or more? 30 years or more, okay? You know, like, I mean, there's a lot of Sisyphuses out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, everybody knows, if you've been around, I've been at Reason since 93, I've been reading it since sometime in the 70s. You know, it's better now. We are further along in all sorts of ways than we were. And I want to talk about what's going on, what it means and what's going on. We live in a moment, in a prolonged moment of rapidly proliferating choices, options, and possibilities of being in the world. We can be more who we want to be than ever before. Anybody here had a father who worked for IBM in the 60s or 70s? Okay, one couple people. It, I mean, you know, in, in the 60s, uh, working for IBM was kind of like the greatest job that you could pretty much have. But it meant a lot of things, and it meant mostly giving up a lot of things. First off, you had to be a man. Secondly, if you were a salesman, you had to wear a, a navy blue suit and wear a white shirt with a red tie and black shoes, and you had to follow a script. When you went to work, it was, you were supposed to have no personality. Check that shit at the door. We live in a different world and a better world, and this is what I, what I want to talk about is the, the world that we're living in, and it's where you can be who you want to be whenever you want to be, wherever you want to be, and who you want to be can change, and people are increasingly okay with that um, in many parts of our lives. And so uh, because I'm a simple person who likes to eat, uh, I am going to use uh, some props here from uh, the local grocery store. What was it called? Shaw's, I think, or something. Uh, to explain how, what a different world we live in. And I like to uh, drive this home with Pop-Tarts. How many of you like Pop-Tarts? Okay. So Pop-Tarts were created in the mid-60s by Kellogg's. Uh, it was a, a play, a pun on the pop art craze, Pop-Tarts rather than Pop-Arts. When, when they started, there were four flavors. Uh, there was strawberry, blueberry, uh, sh brown sugar cinnamon and one that was some kind of apple thing which faded very quickly. They all look like this and honestly they all tasted the same too, okay? If you go to the Pop-Tart section of your grocer, uh, you will find now more than three dozen or at least there are more than three dozen types of Pop-Tarts available for sale from Kellogg's. They look like this. This is technically called wild berry, and it uh, claims to be wild licious on the cover. But you can see there's, you know, there's a distinct here. Here's another flavor. I just pulled a couple at random from the local grocery store. This is uh, confetti cupcake, okay? And you can see, I mean, something has happened where we go from, uh, we go from this this or something like that and what I want to suggest is that this is emblematic of the changes that have been wrought and that are continuing to unfold in American society and actually in world society. Uh, I like to, uh, you know, I also like to stroll down the produce aisle. Um, how many of you can remember a world in which eggplants were only dark purple or black? Okay, I live part-time in the DC area. There's a, on 17th Street there's a, a Safeway store called the Socialist Safeway, or sometimes the Stalinist Safeway, because it's the shittiest supermarket in the world. It's like something that, you know, uh, Leningrad, during the siege of Stalingrad, they would have been ashamed at the selection of goods there. Even there, you can find about four different types of eggplants. You can find the original white eggplant, which is why it was called an eggplant, Japanese eggplant, baby eggplants, regular uh, eggplants, or conventional eggplants, late-term eggplants. I mean. Something has changed. I, and in the supermarket at the Shaw's, uh, for instance, I saw this. And I'm going to start throwing stuff at the audience, by the way. It's what I do. Uh, but I don't even know what this is. Okay, I think it's supposed to be a dragon fruit. It had a sticker on it which explained to you how to eat the fucking thing. Uh, and this was something why I started loving America. At, I guess it was sometime in the 80s or 90s when... You know, and it was partly because trade, uh, trade policy changed. We opened up, we started allowing more imports. Uh, 
and whatnot, and you, suddenly you were getting fruits and vegetables that had instructions on them. That is a beautiful thing where new things are coming. So I don't know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss this into the crowd. Can somebody catch it? Uh, and I don't, really don't know if it's gonna go off or not because this looks like something you would find more in Iraq, but okay. All right, there you go, enjoy it. Here for the, uh, for the loser, some Pop-Tarts, okay, who wants? Pop-Tarts, okay, I, I don't want to hurt anybody, but you know, it's no fun. If, if nobody can get hurt, it's not a party, right? So, if nobody, and uh, from what I understand about the big gay dance party, if nobody can con uh, contract an STD, it's not really a dance party. So, we'll find out later tonight. There, we got a couple more. Oh, well, there you go, look at this. Sign these guys up. Who knew uh, New Hampshire rights were so good at catching stuff? Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, and another thing, here's another uh, odd thing. Uh, this is an Asian pear. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at fruit, I don't see race. <laughs> but an Asian pear, who would have thought? Uh, you know, in my day, there was one type of pear uh, available and it came in a can and it came the choice was heavier light syrup but here's an Asian pear pretty ripe should be tasty as with all things wash before you uh, wash your fruit before you eat it I suppose uh, and I also hear this is a uh, I, and I just picked this up because it struck me as odd I lived in Philadelphia in the late 80s I was going to grad school and uh, Philadelphia anybody here eat macrobiotically not so much anymore, a couple people. Well, Philadelphia was one of the centers, certainly on the east coast of the macrobiotic uh, food movement in America. And it was hard as hell to find things like seaweed and even like good brown rice, all of the things that are staples to macrobiotic. And here we are in the middle of, I don't even know where we are. I think we're in New Hampshire. And we have Annie Chun's roasted seaweed snacks, wasabi, uh, roasted, savory roasted Korean seaweed with wasabi. You know, this is awesome. This is awesome, we're finding this everywhere. So that's, and, and again, this is a, uh, you know, it's a shorthand or an ex it's an example of what's been going on throughout American life, throughout the developed world and even the developing world. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter, the uh, Austrian economist, Austrian born economist who ended up uh, teaching at Harvard is the guy who came up with the term creative destruction. What he talked about that was that capitalism or a free enterprise system, a classical liberal system where individuals had rights uh, to be left alone and to make choices in their life where they could own property that they could trade relatively free to, freely, that it was uh, characterized by creative destruction, a constant changing of goods and services that responded to people's ever-changing demands, desires, uh, whatnot. He talked about this in terms of mutations, and this is why many people, can, old line conservatives, as well as uh, socialists, hated capitalism and ha they hated classical liberalism because it was constantly changing. It was never one thing. It was constantly becoming whatever people wanted it to become as your desires change, as your, as your demands change. People would create new things. You would come up with whole new ideas, of ways of doing things, and see if anybody liked them. Uh, Schumpeter uh, romance, the entrepreneur. But he called these things mutations, which I also uh, wanted to bring up because how many of you are X-Men fans? Okay, yeah. The X-Men started in the mid-60s, a few years before Pop-Tarts actually were invented. And the X-Men, I would argue, are you know, kind of like the, the heroes of the age. There's a reason why, basically in the 21st century, that's been the most successful movie franchise. And it's starting a, you know, yet another iteration. Um, but it's because they're mutants. It's because they're shapeshifters. It's because they're interesting and different and incredibly varied, just like our Pop-Tarts, just like our produce, uh, just like things like this. Here is some Siriachi, again, uh, Siriachi mayo. Siriachi pepper sauce was unknown in America in the early 60s. This is gonna hurt when it hits you, so <laughs> I wanna make sure. Does anybody have a catcher's mitt? But not only do we have super spicy foreign sauces, but we now have it mixed with mayo, which is about as American as apple pie, uh, and it's just kind of great. Uh, someone who wants a, uh, all right. All right, this is, here we go, all right, one. Oh, look at that. Sign that guy up. But uh, to get back to the mutants, I noticed, uh, and I got into the uh, flips, chocolate-covered pretzels last night, 
they are uh, flips. Uh, you know what, a mutant form of pretzel covered with chocolate that is branded with the X-Men. He says mutant milk chocolate. And here, I'll throw this one out. This is Wolverine white fudge. Look at this. What, a, what an amazing world we live in where constantly changing, uh, constantly changing products, goods and services, identities, communities are being formed to uh, fill whatever needs we think we have at a current moment. So, um, you know, and uh, uh, let me uh, talk in terms of, uh, you know, some examples of proliferating choice that matter. Uh, you know, more, per, arguably more than Pop-Tarts or vegetables, although those things are important. I mean, uh, let's not uh, pretend they aren't. What? Yeah, sure, GMOs. You know what, I understand some of those, uh, you know, some of those change whether you ask them to or not. So it's, uh, we can argue about that. But uh, let me, uh, you know, in education, how many of you think education is important? Okay, most of you. Uh, you're probably wrong, but what the hell, let's go along with that, okay? Now, in how, do you know how many kids were in charter schools? Charter schools are not a particularly revolutionary idea. They don't disrupt, how many here think the state should be totally out of education? Okay, fair amount. Okay, charter schools are a huge reform. They're not particularly drastic because it doesn't change the idea that you know, schools should be mandatory and that the state should provide it. How many people, but they do offer an immense amount of freedom for parents and students to find schools or educational establishments that they think are good fits for their kids' uh, needs or their kids' desires. How many kids were in charter schools in 1996? Yes? How many? In nine, no, I wasn't at, you know, you've got to pay attention. I bet, you, are you homeschooled? Because you're not listening, okay? Okay, yeah. I don't think you were. Okay, I don't think you were though. Not a, not a publicly funded charter school. Okay, because the first publicly funded charter school opened in Minnesota in 1997. But let's take it back a year then. I'll say the number of people, the number of kids in publicly funded charter schools in 1995, so that we don't have to worry about it, was zero. They did not exist. Now it is uh, on the order of two million kids are going to charter schools and there are more than 6,000 charters in, in the country. This is, a, this is another version of the Pop-Tart. So instead of going to a school that was like every other school in the country and that looked like every other school and looked like every other prison in the country, two million kids are now getting to pick or choose or their parents where they go. That's a great triumph. That's part of the libertarian moment. Individualization, personalization, choice, you know, options. Uh, Ludwig von Mises, are there any Ludwig von Mises fans in this crowd? And I suspect there are. And trust me, when I was, uh, when I joined Reason 20 years ago, I never would have dreamed that I'd be in a position to ask a room full of people, are there any Ludwig von Mises fans? This is part of the libertarian moment. But, uh, you know, it's all about man is the choosing animal. Praxeology, we're constantly making choices. More people can choose the education they want for their kids or themselves. That's great. Culture broadly defined. Uh, there has never been a better time if you like art, if you like music, if you like video, if you like literature, if you like any form of creative expression. It is easier now than ever before in human history to make and, uh, to make and consume culture that you want in the form that you want, at the price that you want, under the circumstances that you want. Anybody here remember Borders bookstores? Okay. Anybody here remember before Borders and Barnes and Noble? If you didn't live in New York City, you were generally, or a major city, you were shit out of luck for a bookstore that had more than about 100 titles. Um, Borders and Barnes and Noble came along in the 90s and really brought this book superstore model to scale. And suddenly we went from Walden Books, which might have been wedged in between a anti, you know, Ann's pretzels and a uh, Hot Topic itself, which is pretty fucking awesome. I wish those had been around when I was a kid. But, you know, a Walden Books that was about as wide as this table and about as deep in terms of selection, suddenly you, uh, the typical Borders bookstore had 140,000 different titles, uh, 2,000 uh, 2, different magazine titles, and 50,000 music CDs. Does anybody remember CDs? 
Okay, you know, how rapidly things change. And that then was almost immediately dwarfed by the offerings on Amazon and other online bookstores, whether it's used bookstores like ABE or Powell's Books based in Oregon, where suddenly the world's libraries were available to people. You could finally find books and buy books and get, you know, in, in a way that was just unthinkable unless you lived uh, in a major city or near a major research university. Culture, broadly defined, more choices, more options. This is the libertarian moment. When we think about things like race and gender and sexual identity, is anybody here confused about their sexual identity? And, it, and let me tell you right now, if you're not, you're not trying hard enough, okay? <laughs> but for much of our history, American history, there were three options available in terms of race. Uh, you know, and there was white, there was black, and there was American Indian, and you didn't get to choose. Those were chosen for you. Uh, you know, things have changed now. Uh, when you, uh, in the 90s, uh, uh, Tiger Woods, does anyone, uh, yeah, I realize now this is kind of a valid, this is a backward looking speech, but does anyone remember Tiger Woods pre-car uh, accident? Woods, Woods made a huge splash when he defined himself. As, he's a mixed race American and he called himself a Cablinasian because he was part Caucasian, part black. Part, uh, part Native American and part Asian uh, as well. So he called himself a Cablinasian and he was a marker like Pop-Tarts, like you know, fruits and vegetables in the produce aisle. All of a sudden, instead of where there was only one or two or three categories, you could define yourself as you wanted to and in a mix and, and it would change over time. Uh, uh, Facebook gender types, or gender identification. This, and th these are weak versions of what I'm talking about, but you know, uh, Facebook for a while you could be male or female, basically. Now there are more than a dozen terms by which you can affiliate or signify yourself. And of course these are lagging indicators of how we're actually doing things. So again and again in American culture uh, and in world culture, where there was one, there are many, uh, you know, many options, many choices. This, this, when I talk about the libertarian moment, that's what I'm talking about, where across the board in so many parts of our lives, we have more choices rather than fewer, and they are multiplying all the time. And we are directing them. You know, one of the ways to uh, think about this is that the, uh, how many of you remember the top 40? Casey Kasem just died. You know, this is like, uh, and he was, he's kind of like the personification of the top 40, but the top four, how many of you remember cars where the only option was an AM radio, you know? And that's when the top 40 was on. And, you know, the top 40 in a way was fun, it was great. You would hear weird songs one right after another. Um, but by the same token, uh, you know, the top 40 died the very minute that we could change, we could choose what we wanted to listen to. All of a sudden, when you know, the Walkman came out, I mean, this is insane to think about like the revolutionary implications of the Walkman, a personal sound system that you could carry with you, even though it weighed about 10 pounds, I, I, as I remember, and it would always run out of batteries, which it went through like nobody's business. Uh, but, you know, the top 40 is dead, the mainstream is dead in America. E pluribus unum, from one, uh, from many, one, is now something different and better, which is from one, many. And it doesn't mean that we're at each other's throats. When you look at most indicators of violence and many uh, social dysfunction, we're more at peace than ever before, not because we, uh, we can live separate lives, or rather, we're, we're more at peace with each other precisely because we're not forced into the same situation, all of us, but rather we can pick and choose, and then suddenly, you know, you can look at that tent community over there and say, you know what they're doing, that sounds kind of interesting. I'm gonna go over there and see if I like it. Or I'm going to adapt parts of it to my life. And then they're looking at you and they're saying, well, that's kind of interesting. Let's meet up and talk about stuff, what we have in common, what we don't. And as long as the broad framework is one of peace and of respect and of toleration, we're in good shape. And that's the libertarian moment. Um, so what I want to do now in, uh, for a couple minutes is talk about, uh, well, and let me explain where the, that kind of growth in, um, in choices and proliferating choices, identities, possibilities come from. I'd argue that it comes from basically four sources. The first is wealth. Uh, free market economy, everybody agrees uh, about this, you know, even Kim Jong-un 
uh, agrees that, you know, a free, generally speaking, a free market economy, loosely defined as just something where people have stuff and they can trade it and make money, generates an enormous amount of wealth. Wealthy people, uh, wealthy people feel uh, stronger about pursuing their interests. Uh, you know what, it's like, uh, damn it, I'm worth it. You know, it's not just a slogan for hair dye, uh, you know, that you're worth the extra stretch, but it's like I have money and I want to use it in a way that will allow me, to, that will reflect who I am in everything that I do. Part of it is rising levels of education. People are more and more, uh, they spend more and more time in school. And that, you know, as we all know, that gives you a lot of time to daydream and think about stuff that you would actually rather be doing. Uh, you create different businesses, you create different lifestyles, you go different places. Mostly it's because of technology, I would say. So, you know, what technology does, like with the top 40, the minute that FM radio comes online, suddenly you have more options. And then it's personal devices where you can listen. Uh, we live now in a world where you can listen to radio stations, you don't have to be some kind of freaky ham radio operator, or shortwave radio operator. You, all you have to do, uh, assuming you're not in a place like this with the, you know, this is the last uh, Wi-Fi free zone, I think, in America, but all you have to do is look at your, I know, we're working on it, we're working on it, yeah. You know what, I hear that, when I hear that from the government, I don't believe it, okay, I'm just saying. Uh, but, um, you know, you, you, you have the world at your fingertips in terms of all sorts of stuff. And so technology allows us to route around all kinds of blockages or attempts to squeeze us into one or two versions of things. And then the fourth reason, uh, and I'm going to kind of trot through this so we can get to some questions and answers, but, you know, it's also because the major drivers in our political discourse, the, the people who have created the major political identities, the major political parties, have destroyed their credibility. They have shit the bed. Of, they have shit their own bed. Uh, and just keeping it to the 21st century, you know, when you think about it, what we're in now, and this is a golden opportunity for libertarians, anarchists, minarchists, uh, you know, whatever you want to say, people who want to have more choices, more options to live however they want to live. The GOP had eight, uh, six years of uh, fully owning the federal government under George Bush, and this was a guy who said he was a small government conservative, a limited government conservative. He, uh, unlike Bill Clinton, was going to pursue a humble foreign policy. He wanted to get the government out of people's lives and businesses and stuff like that. So what did he do in his time as president? He increased federal spending by 50% in real terms. That's massive, essentially unprecedented in the post-war era. 60%, he increased spending on regulatory compliance by 62% in uh, inflation-adjusted terms. Uh, you know, this, if this is limited government, you know, count me out. Uh, then towards, of course, uh, in Iraq, or in Afghanistan, and then Iraq, he didn't just commit troops, uh, you know, young men and women to uh, be blown up and killed, both on our side and the other side, but he pursued nation-building. You know, it's one thing to go after bin Laden, who was responsible for 9-11. It's another thing to say, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's another thing to say, it's, it's another thing to say, what, we're going to stay in Afghanistan until finally uh, they get it right, by which, whatever that means, we don't know, uh, or Iraq, or whatever. Uh, you know, just insane, and then he, he you know, kind of like burned out, and uh, he was a uh, brilliant yellow spider, a, a human Roman candle exploding in the sky at the end of his presidency where he pushed through TARP and auto bailouts, where he actually had the temerity to say, what's up? Okay, yeah, that was in the beginning of 2008. You're right. No, no, he pursued a multi-billion dollar stimulus program in, two th in the early part of 2008, uh, which Republicans loved, and then a year later, and I'll get to this, when Obama came out with the stimulus program, they were like, oh, you know, this is socialism. But uh, Bush actually said, you know what, I believe in free markets, and I believe in capitalism, and that is why I am taking over the banks, this is why I am t uh, nationalizing car companies, to, you know, in order to say, I mean, it basically, and the words are a little bit different, but in order to save capitalism, I need to destroy it. Thank you. You know, and this is one of, this opens up a huge opportunity. Only the dead uh, among us recognize that the GOP is for limited government, is for individual freedom, is for capitalism, is for freedom in any way, shape, or form. Now, the Democrats, 
you know, and we're six years in or whatever of the Obama years, which have been their own form of disaster that are almost a perfect mirror to the, uh, to the Bush years. And this is taking down not just the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, both of whom are leaking market share like GM and Chrysler uh, have been over the years. Um, under uh, the Democrats, under Obama, you know, first we had wars. Remember, Obama was the anti-war candidate. Uh, and then he tripled troops in Afghanistan and is calling that a success. And it's, we can't get out of there quick enough except for the 10,000, you know, kids we'll leave behind. Uh, but he was not an anti-war candidate at all, or he didn't, he didn't govern that way. Uh, in terms of civil liberties, this was a guy who supposedly was going to countermand all of the Bush excesses in terms of Guantanamo Bay, in terms of spying, and in terms of torture, and it turned out that you know, he was lying about that. He was full of shit on that. And that, you know, that hurts, especially, you know, for libertarians, it's like we're skeptical of government in general. Uh, we're skeptical of most things, so it doesn't hurt us the way that it must just kill liberal Democrats who actually believe that Obama was going to be different or that he was going to do what he said. Um, when it comes, you know, uh, health care, he got his health care reform. Uh, and he got, he sold it mostly on two things that have later, you know, widely understood as just dissembling, uh, if not outright lies. One was that Obamacare was not going to add one slim dime to the deficit. That is not true. And we already know that. And CBO has just recently, that scores these things, has said, you know what, we can't even account for how much money is going to be spent on this compared to the legislation that was passed because it has changed so much. You know, thanks, Obama. Uh, and then more importantly, uh, arguably said, you know what, uh, if you like your plan, you can keep it. PolitiFact, which is a press watchdog, that's generally, you know, most people would say it's, it's pretty friendly towards Obama. They concluded that that was their lie of the year uh, this past year because, in fact, that was just not true. You're not going to get to keep the plan that you like. Uh, and so, you know, and what I'm getting at here is simply that the Democrats, like the Republicans, over the past, you know, they have had a clean shot at doing what they wanted and implementing their vision of the good society, and they've been shown to be frauds. I might also add that Obama signaled, or, or maybe people were projecting onto him because he actually said very little concrete. He was going to be great on gay marriage, on pot legalization. He was, you know, he was a charter member of the Chum Gang in high school. He knew how to smoke dope. You know, he wasn't going to be like George Bush. He wasn't going to be like Republicans. Uh, you know, on immigration, he, uh, you know, he himself is a multinational. Uh, you know, he lived in Hawaii, lived in Indonesia. He's been terrible. On drug legalization, he prosecuted more, his Justice Department prosecuted more raids on medical marijuana dispensaries that were fully compliant with California state law than George Bush did. He deported more immigrants than George Bush did. This is a guy who's pro-immigrant, who's, who's good on drugs. Gay marriage, he only copped to, you know, kind of growing on that issue after Joe Biden got out in front of him to say, rightly, you know, what the hell is the problem with gay marriage? And Obama realized he had to secure, in a politically contentious uh, fight or season, he had to actually, you know, say, yeah, you know what, I don't have a problem with gay marriage. It's just, he's, he, like Bush before him, has... Um, discredited not just the Democratic Party in the short term and the Republican Party in the short term, but they've made it very clear to people that these parties are not what they say and that they're much more alike than they are different. This helps explain why at this point about 25% of the American population, according to Gallup, identifies as Republican. It's a historic low. And really the, the, the obvious question is like, who are these 25% percent of the population and what do they, what else has to happen before they're like, yeah, you know what, I'm not going to be a Republican anymore. Democrats are also at near historic lows and it's sloping down in the low 30s. The only group that is rising are political independents and it's because we have had enough. Uh, you know, we're not going to play that game anymore and we don't want to, if we can have 36 types of Pop-Tarts, maybe we can have more than two political identities in America. So, you know, not everything is sweetness and light. In all of the things that I've talked about where there's positive developments, there's also negative ones. There's always a pushback in American history. 
is really, uh, it, you know, uh, the great political scientist and historian Arthur E. Kirch Jr. Uh, said that, the, you know, America, even in the colonial period, was always about forces of centralization versus decentralization. We're never going to go away from it. But, you know, and this is still a pace. So even in education, where there are many positive developments, the fact is, is forces of centralization and of top-down control are still with us and are pushing back. Uh, in 1950, there were over 100,000 school districts in America. Basically, every town was its own school district. Now there are fewer than 13,000, and the number continues to shrink as they get consolidated in the name of efficiency or wisdom or whatever, uh, with things like No Child Left Behind, which was pushed through by George Bush, or the Common Core requirements, which are being pushed through now under the Obama administration. These are attempts not to dictate every aspect of the K through 12 curriculum, but to exert more federal control and direction of these things. So on the one hand, charter schools and homeschooling and other opt-outs are decentralizing, but then we see this decentralization, or the centralization on the other hand. In terms of cultural production and consumption, even as things are more wide open than ever, you'll see people calling for net neutrality uh, in the name of preserving an open internet when in fact what they're saying is that the government should limit and dictate acceptable business models uh, for ISPs and whatnot. And we can argue about that. I realize libertarians are not all, uh, surprisingly libertarians don't all think alike on every topic. But, uh, you know, there are antitrust rumblings against Amazon because Amazon is uh, forcing publishers to drop their prices for books. Well, the bastards. How many of you are readers? You know, it's like you would think you'd be pretty happy with that, but, you know, book publishers and authors are not so happy with the idea that uh, people should pay less for their goods. The FCC, whose uh, essential legislative mandate was to, to you know, allocate the spectrum space uh, and then kind of uh, negotiate um, uh, spectrum uh, disputes over whether or not this station or channel was crowding out my channel and whatnot. I mean, this was a technical issue that was solved by the end of the 30s, but they're constantly trying to ex extend their mission and their reach to control content. They, can, they have uh, the ability to control content on broadcast, over the air stuff, on CBS, NBC, ABC. That's why, you know, they, it took them a decade to, uh, let, let, ugh, to litigate the case of Janet Jackson's nipple. Uh, you know, and they're trying to do that first to cable and satellite and eventually to the internet. They're constantly making chases. The Aereo case, which uh, was just decided by the Supreme Court wrongly, I think, yesterday, is another example of where you know, the forces of centralization are denying technological innovation that would empower end users to make and create, to make, create, and consume culture the way they want. Gender and sexuality, there's pushback on you know, this broadening and this kind of easing up of like, okay, we don't have to be male and female. We don't have to be straight or gay. We can be all sorts of things. Uh, we can be all sorts of races. Uh, Maxine Waters, who's a congresswoman from uh, California, famously said that when uh, Tiger Woods started to define himself in this Cablin Asian category, she was like, I don't like that. It just blurs everything. And that's kind of the point, but you understand why people who are invested in a system, even one that treated African Americans terribly, are kind of like, you know what, I've learned, I've learned how to work within this system. I've learned how to work within this computer language. Let's stop progress now when I, when I finally figured things out and are, are working the system pretty well. Uh, th the other thing in terms of this kind of gender, race, identity, sexuality, there is a war on pleasure that is absolutely as powerful as the war towards pleasure uh, in more ways than, uh, you know, in more ways than our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents could, uh, could ever uh, expect. We're able to create a world in which we can feel good and where we can feel things, where we aren't hung up at the same time we have a war on pleasure. Don't eat that. Uh, it's got gluten in it. Don't eat that. It'll make you fat. Obesity is the worst sin of all in a non-religious age. It's like the last cardinal sin. Uh, so, you know, there are always these forces of liberation and these forces of repression that we're not going to get out of. But what has changed is that because we are wealthier, because, generally speaking, because we f are more educated about who we are and what we want and we're willing to say, no, I, I deserve this. Um, because technology has allowed us to do, to dream something and then to do it, to make our dreams a reality. 
and because the major political, ideological commitments in American public discourse, Republican, Democrat, uh, liberal, conservative, have destroyed their own credibility. We have more, we have an opening. Uh, we're making inroads in all aspects of American politics and culture uh, because in the end, and this is I think the promise of the Free State Project, I think it is the, what Porkfest is all about. Um, is that, you know, we finally, we're showing demonstration projects, uh, you know, kind of that can go up to scale of what it's like to live in a world that is less uptight about everything and allows people more space to make decisions for themselves and to say, hey, this is who I am, this is how I live. Do you want to join me? Or what can you learn from me? What can I learn from you? We're making inroads. This is the libertarian moment, and I think we are growing it, and we need to keep pushing for it because we have the right answer to the question in the end, which is, do you want to live in this world, or do you want to live in a world like this, one that is colorful and constantly changing? I will end it there, and let's uh, have some questions and answers. Thank you very much. And I've uh, been asked, if you want to ask a question, please uh, come up to the mic so that everybody can hear you. Yes. Hi. I just want to correct myself because you were right and I was wrong. And it was a magnet school in 1996. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And remember, kids, don't eat magnets. Uh, don't eat magnets. Uh, what were the uh, buckyballs? Did anybody here buy buckyballs? Speaking of magnets, these were uh, hypercharged magnets which were pulled off the market because uh, regulators were afraid that kids would eat them. Uh, you know, so there you go. Great innovation makes the world a little bit more fun and then we've, you, you know, we can't have that, for God's sake. Kids might eat magnets. Yep. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm going to take you to, uh, to your, your you know, libertarian moment and choices. Sure. You know, when we had only four Pop-Tarts, yep. I had a choice as a kid to actually ride in my father's, uh, you know, uh, pickup truck bed, and I mm -hmm. could actually, you know, ride a motorcycle without a, a helmet. Do you ever I mean, I could, uh, fall I, off that motorcycle? Nope. Do you ever hit your head? Nope. Maybe you're thinking not too clearly but well, yeah, actually it's a, it's, well, it's a yeah. choice right yeah so I, I I figured that you know we're 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 getting all of these artificial choices which are really you know I have a choice between bad and yeah. bad and bad and bad right. and really when I come to make the real choices for myself then I can't make these because somebody has already decided you see this is where I think that we're regressing and I'm Canadian right so I'm from Canada so that's the socialist yep. state yep. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> right there, so we're a little further along. Yeah. You, you guys are getting there, though, but, um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Let me, uh, you know, first off, I'll uh, respond by, I believe uh, the lyrics to uh, the song from uh, the South Park movie go something like, fuck yeah. Canada. No, uh, but blame, blame Canada. Yeah. Blame Trust me, Canada. There's, there's a chorus. Blame there's, there is a chorus where they say, fuck uh -huh. Canada. But in fact, Canada is an interesting country because it's much more, in many ways, is much more decentralized uh, in terms of governance than the United States. But to your, your large point, and so we can, uh, uh, you know, have more questions and answers. The question here is kind of like, okay, well, are these choices, and this is uh, an old school left, leftist critique of, I think, of capitalism that's worth engaging. You know, who cares if you have all these choices if it's between Crest and Colgate? You know, like what difference? These are distinctions without meaning. What, and there's some truth to that. You know, it's like who cares if you have like strawberry Pop-Tarts or strawberry frosted or low fat strawberry Pop-Tarts, you know, whatever. By the same token, these are lagging indicators of stuff that's more important. You know what, it really matters if you can marry or if you can live openly with the person you love. You know, nobody would say, you know what, uh, you know, like, so you're, you know, you're having sex with a man or a woman, like, it doesn't matter, it's just holes, right? You know, it's like, it, there are more choices and they matter. And it matters a hell of a lot that my kids will not be burdened by, you know, the restrictions that I grew up under or that my parents did in terms of gender, in terms of sexuality, in terms of schooling, in terms of possibility. So I think, I think you're right, we need to always realize 
we need to be talking about important things, but we can also find important choices, in, or, you know, or important lessons in small, oftentimes trivial choices. And those things aren't trivial either. It matters like if you can read what you want to read. Uh, and I think we can do that more now than we used to be able to. But, yeah. yeah just, as an as, just as an aside, in, in much of the United States, you can ride without a helmet if you want to. Sure. Well, um, that's if but, you follow the law. Uh, well, yeah. You know, uh, I think it's Henry David Thoreau. Any Thoreau fans out here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, throw, uh, you know, be a, throw yourself upon the machine. You don't have to follow the laws. That's, that's part that's of it. That's true. But and you know, and I, I say that as I'm talking to. I just realized this guy is packing heat, so I take it all back. I, I, I was going to mention yes. that, that we might be talking about how much, you know, it's, it's frequent as libertarians that we decry how much worse things are getting yes. politically. But with every passing week, there are more states where there's marriage equality. And with every mm -hmm. passing year, there are more states where you can carry. Right. I, I don't think that there has been a time for a century where there were as many states where there was, where there was either mandatory issue of carry permits or mm -hmm. no regulation at all. There are now like four yep. states which have constitutional carry. And, and we're, we're, we are really, really into telling ourselves that everything is spiraling down the right. toilet. Uh, but if you look around- By the way, toilets, we have many more choices of those now as well. You can, you can, you can, yeah. you can now- is, is, is Big Toilet, like is American Standard one of the sponsors this year or something? It seems so. Yeah, I, I don't know, you know, you can now pick up actually Japanese washlets in the United yes. States, which are, which okay. are, you know, so, the ultimate in choice. Well, uh, you know, I think the comment is well taken, and it is something, uh, uh, libertarians, like all Americans, uh, there's a uh, famous book uh, that came out in the early 70s about the American Jeremiad as the American literary form, the basic literary form. We're constantly denouncing things and talking about how we're sinners in the hands of an angry God. But in fact, things do get better, uh, and things have been getting better. And I guess to bring it back to Canada, uh, as uh, the last uh, questioner was talking, there's a uh, candidate for something. I don't know what they, what, what is, in Canada, what is it? It's like, is it, uh, they run like Smurf villages or something like that? They have chants and sing-alongs. But no, there's a candidate named Moen who's, uh, po Tim Moen, whose poster was, I support the right of my gay married friends to protect their marijuana plants with guns. And it's like, okay, yeah. I can, yeah, that's, that's kind of a great world which nobody could have imagined even 10 or 20 years ago. So, yes. Did he get elected? Oh, okay. All right, there you go. Yes. Um, I really appreciate the Pop-Tart analogy because my family, we moved from the Soviet Union to Canada about 16 years ago. And my father says he, he moved to Canada, he goes into the grocery store and he s goes into the milk aisle and he sees kefir. He doesn't see just kefir, he sees seven different flavors of kefir, this appropriated drink from, the, from Eastern Europe, this yogurt drink. And he just stands there in awe, unable to make up a decision for half an hour. Yeah. And... To me, that is a s symbolic uh, kind of experience of freedom and the freedom of choice and the freedom of capitalist free markets, which creates opportunity and the ability to make a decision unlike the country that I'm from, which right. you know, still stagnated in that uh, regard. And when I talk to people from Canada, especially there's a lot of hate towards America and mm -hmm. capitalism, and of course they're all young socialist uh, can students. Canadians are the worst. We are, we really, I'm, I've, I've, Except for I the ones who move here. Yeah, I once described Canada, I, I once referred to us as America, the continent of North America. Mm. And they're like, do not, do not even put us in the same category as Americans. So mm. Canadians are very socialist in that regard. But the only reason they are is because they're so used to the wealth that they're born yeah. into. And they don't realize where that wealth has come from. So thank you for... Well, having that you. as a theme, because I totally, that resonates with me 100%. And uh, remember, uh, you don't even have to eat breakfast. If you don't, this is a world of choice. It's not about which Pop-Tart to eat. It's do you want Pop-Tarts or do you want kefir? Do you want, uh, you know, a, uh, a bacon? Yes, there are certainly more types of bacon in the world than ever before. Uh, or you don't have to eat breakfast at all. So choices, choices are a good thing. Yes. 
How are you doing? So my question is, um, how do you eliminate embassies and consulates abroad? Uh, how yes. do you yes, eliminate I know it sounds embassies really weird. and consulates abroad? I actually uh, don't think we should eliminate embassies and consulates. They're not the problem. Military bases, yeah, let's get rid of those. Uh, and, that, and that's a harder question. And this is something, you know, libertarians have gone oftentimes from being dismissed as irrelevant and hence not worthy of engaging in, in American politics, culture, and ideas, to being to blame for all of the ills of the world. Slate magazine, when the financial crisis hit, Jacob Weisberg, who co-wrote a book with Robert Rubin, wrote a piece about how, you know what, the, finan the banking crisis was all the libertarians' fault. And it's kind of like, wow, that's, you know, who knew we were that powerful? Uh, there's a, a piece in the New Republic that's talking about how the EU only came about because of libertarians, and it's a disaster. There's something that's like, oh, all right, great, you know, I, I slept through that but, one. The but, question, though, is how do we, you know, in terms of foreign policy, for a long time, and I am not an isolationist, I don't know exactly what that term means in reality, I understand the cartoon version of it. I am a non-interventionist, and I think most libertarians are. We should, which doesn't mean that you don't engage other people. This is we're citizens of the world, first and foremost. Um, and what it means is that you, you exchange through culture, you exchange through goods and services. You have a military to protect yourself, but you don't have a mili uh, military to try and transform Iraq into the new Detroit. Um, which is something that we've been doing. But my, my question so. is more emphasized in, um, like, there's the lady from Canada, there's many people from England, from Germany. Uh, the most uh, well-known example is that there are 50 consulates in the U.S. Uh, for, who participate in political activities, mm -hmm. who do a lot of, uh, who, who they produce the documents on documented people who live in here. How do you take most of embassies and most of uh, foreign consulates from China, Japan, mm -hmm. or Argentina here in the US? I don't know. Okay, that's. I, I know only that I do not know. I think. Uh, is, it, is it desirable to have. He said right before he said, oh, by the way, yeah, I'll take the hemlock. Uh huh. But, so. Okay. Thank you. Hi, yes. thanks. This has been great. Um, so the Koch brothers are clearly massively powerful, and increasingly so, and being painted by uh, the liberal media, at the very least, as like the ringleaders of the new GOP. Yeah. So like how, and, they, and obviously they fund a tremendous amount of like libertarian thinking. Well, you know, I don't know about you, but if I was a member of the GOP and over the past eight years, or you know, over the, I mean, the GOP hasn't won a presidential election outright you know, they won one in 2004, uh, 2000 they lost the popular vote, and then you're going back to 1988. So it's like, they're I, whatever they're doing, they're really, I, you know, maybe the Koch brothers are secret Democrats then. Mm -hmm. But, oh, well, so, yeah, so, wait. This person. I'm just saying, what's your question? My, my question is, what, what kind of impact do you think the Koch brothers and the institutions they fund are going to play in the incubation and maturation yep. of, like, this this movement or this movement? I will, uh, you know what, I think it, as easy as to say what role have they played, I recommend, I interviewed the author and I also wrote a piece for the Daily Beast, I believe it was titled Libertarianism 3.0, but uh, there's a new book out called Sons of Wichita by a Mother Jones reporter uh, named Daniel Shulman, or the Mother Jones editor. It um, is, it's a really interesting book. It, it's extremely flattering to uh, David and Charles Koch. David Koch is on the board of trustees of Reason Foundation, and I've met Charles Koch a couple of times. I, I wouldn't pretend to say that they have had undue influence on any specific decision I've made. Uh, I also got a, a grad school fellowship at IH through Institute for Humane Studies, which is funded by Charles Koch. Uh, be that as it may, Sons of Wichita is a great reading of uh, the American libertarian movement and the commitment that the Koch brothers have had going way back to, uh, you know, libertarian ideas, not conservative ideas. So I, I don't know, I'm not privy to their strategies and stuff, but they have funded a lot of the major organizations, the Cato Institute, Institute for Humane Studies, Mercatus Center, Competitive Enterprise Institute, a lot of the organizations that have helped create the modern uh, libertarian movement. Thank you. I'd like to talk to you about uh, net neutrality. So, okay. in theory, you know, net neutrality is bad, being it's government regulation and all. But where I live here in Peterborough, New Hampshire, I have a choice between Comcast, which is good and fast, or right. very, very slow DSL. And uh, without net neutrality, Comcast can basically do whatever they want and 
um, control access to the internet however they want, and I basically don't have another choice. Right. So the problem is that yeah, no yeah. one can compete because whether whether it's regulation or whether it's just it's impossible for another company to get in due to yeah. the price to come in. Yeah, there are lots of different By reasons. The way, is, so like, what is, is your view? Is he speaking for you or are I don't you know. just a puppet? Yeah, he, uh, he, he's, he's giving me he's tips like, here. Okay, um, yeah. So basically, considering the fact that it's not a free market yeah. for ISPs, That's right. how can you be against net neutrality when basically without net neutrality, we really wouldn't have internet no, freedom. Well, uh, it, what's important, I appreciate that, and as I said before, it's it's not a, a clear issue. It's also, you know, things like intellectual property. I tend to be more of a copyright kind of anarchist, mm -hmm. and I realize a lot of libertarians don't follow that, et cetera. Uh, the simplest way, and I'd be happy to talk about this later or at length, or if, if there's a session on things like this, I, I, you know, I would love to hear what people are thinking about this to broaden my understanding, but um, we don't have net neutrality now. There is an open net order from the FCC which has lost the two court battles that it sparked. Um, but what we have, the, the fear of uh, people who are in favor of net neutrality is that uh, given their druthers, places like Comcast or Verizon or Time Warner, which may become part of Comcast, will start saying, hey, you know what, we're going to slow down your ability to, to stream or to view these websites or this services and we're going to put our stuff first and foremost, or we're going to block sites. There are virtually no cases of that happening, and what I, what I would argue, okay, now, you know what, we're not going to have an, a, a <laughs> long conversation. The fact is, is that there are very few cases that are documented of where, okay, this, I, I feel like we're at an Occupy Wall Street thing now, where we're talking about, <laughs> so, use your hands, use your hands. Uh, no, but in any case, the question comes, what do we do? There is no question that the, uh, the cable market in America is not a true free market. Right. The question is whether or not it will, it, it will evolve more into a more open, more robust free market with more or less government regulation. I would argue that less is better in this case because Comcast will find, like all monopolists, that people will tune out or they'll create new things that go around it uh, and that in fact, I, I don't know anybody who has Comcast who loves the company, uh, but they will give you what you need uh, more than the option, which would be to have the government say, no, it's going to be this. So, right. thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yes. So earlier, ooh, I'm sorry. Yep. Um, when you first started the talk, you asked everybody uh, whether they thought kids should be educated. And a lot of people raised their hands. Oh, they're idiots. And I'm sorry? Kids, uh, kids. What, what do they need to be educated for? Okay, so Especially right. in a future with no jobs, right? But, yeah, so go ahead. No, in fact, you know what? I mean, if that's where you're going, that's exactly what they do need to be educated, yeah. right? So right. I wanted you to talk about that. Like, what do you mean by you don't think kids should be educated? Maybe we have a different no. definition of the word, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, what it comes down to, uh, and, uh, you know, part of that is just, uh, you know, playing fast and loose with things, but... I don't think that there's one model of education. I don't think education should be mandatory. Ah, um, I call that school. Yeah, okay, school. I don't call that okay, education. Okay, good, okay, good. I, well, I'm happy to, to leave it at that, you know, that what we should be going after is education, not school, Perfect. for sure. Thank you. That's right. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Okay. You're facing another Canadian. Um, <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. Hope all of you were at our flapjacks. Um, my question is, I work, I, I, I work in the media in Canada. Um, I'm sorry, so say that again? I work in the media. I work in radio. Okay. And just when I, even when I listen to the radio, when I, when I watch TV, and when I read the paper, one thing that I notice is that despite the fact that, that we as journalists might challenge the state, we never outright say that they should not do something. We just say maybe they should do it a different way. How can we then change that conversation, or how can I change that conversation, even within my own work, yeah. to better reflect that, to better reflect that maybe they shouldn't be regulated, like it's not a matter of whether or not marriage should be, like gay marriage should be legal right. or not, it's just that it's none of their fucking business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I, well, you know, I would, I, uh, I appreciate your, uh, your, you know, the, the enthusiasm that you bring to that topic. I think we're having those conversations more and more because mm -hmm with marriage and you know this as somebody who you know I, I I mean in my druthers I would say you know the state should not be involved in marriage marriage is essentially is a religious ceremony and different religions have done great jobs of coming up with different ways of expressing that 
Um, you know, by the same token, as long as the state is doing something, it should extend the same rights to all people. Oh yeah, definitely. So, but, yeah. And I think these are, this is a good debate to have and that what you're finding though is a lot of conservatives who now realize, lo and behold, that they've lost the argument. You know, conservatives who hate homosexuals or liberals, you know, there, there's some, I mean, you know, it's fascinating is that until the uh, mid 70s, uh, you know, if you were a liberal psychoanalyst who was trained in a kind of Freudian method, you path literally pathologized homosexuality. You said that these were people who, who had a mental disorder, you know, and that's flip. But what I'm saying is, is that as, as conservatives have learned that they're not going to be able to stamp out homosexuality, suddenly they're starting to say, oh, well, maybe the state shouldn't be involved in marriage. So, you know, we're having this conversation and it's changing the terms of things and the role of the state. There's a lot of things the state thinks it has to do, which, yeah, you know, we could get along without the state doing it. Yeah, but so. then how do I, how do I, then I incorporate that? Like, that was just an example, but yeah. I mean, like, in general, anything. I mean, like, in, 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 in regards to, like, gun restrictions, because obviously mm -hmm. Canada is much more strict than here. I was, I had the pleasure of getting to shoot my first automatic rifles today, and it was lovely. <laughs> I can't do that at home. Like, how can I even talk way, about that? Can how can I, I ask, <laughs> am I the only total pussy libertarian who <laughs> has no interest in shooting or even holding guns? <laughs> like, and I that realize, is your choice. Yeah, no, but, uh, but yes. like, how, like, with all those, with all those, like, how do I even, uh, how do I even talk about within, within my own writing or with, when I'm talking on air, just saying like. Maybe, how do we have that discussion within media where we don't take the state for granted? We yeah. actually actively say whether or not they should be involved in any aspect. Well, I, you know, have it. Host, you know, it's easier now to host conversations than before. You can start, you know, you don't have to be part of an international uh, media conglomerate to get your voice out there. It doesn't mean, you know, like obviously creating a free, uh, you know, a free blog at Blogspot or doing a, a free podcast somewhere is not going to guarantee an audience, but we can have these conversations. Yeah. And I think Eventually I'd like to we see are it where I, I can say stuff like that on, yeah. on air, because, I mean, every once in a while, I, every once in a while I get to say, you know, it's, it's your tax dollars instead of just X amount of dollars going to charity, right. but that's, that's all I can do right now without my boss saying that I'm, I'm biased for calling a politician vague. So. Thank you. Hopefully it changes. Yes. Right. Um, not to invalidate the uh, incredible Pop-Tart uh, technological mm -hmm. society that we, you spoke of earlier, uh, given the, uh, the Patriot Act, mm -hmm. the Department of Homeland Security, the NDAA, and now yep. Snowden revelations uh, per the recent book that Glenn yep. Greenwald just put out called No Place to Hide, would you say that we're in a police and surveillance state at this point? Yeah, I think we're definitely in a surveillance state and I think it's, uh, you know, first off, uh, to go back to Obama, uh, you know, at one point when he, you know, and he had campaigned on saying he was gonna curb all of the excesses of the secret government that Bush had put into place, whether it was about torture or Guantanamo or a warrantless wiretapping, and, and then he, you know, he maximized those programs, and he kept saying, I wanna have a debate about this, I'm happy to have a debate about that, and then when the Snowden revelations came out, he was like, you know what, let's have this conversation. You know, it's like he could have had the conversation all along and he chose not to. There's no question we live in a surveillance state, and I think it's important for libertarians also not to always limit everything to, oh my God, you know, the government, the government, the government, because we live in a surveillance state partly because all sorts of private surveillance has been growing, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, if you can have a camera on your equipment or if you can track people or track people you do business with more efficiently, it's a form of surveillance and it's not a bad thing. Technology empowers all of us to do surveillance and also what some people call surveillance, which is kind of reverse engineering surveillance from the bottom up, which is in a way is kind of what Snowden did by flipping, you know, by making the secrets of the state open, it changes the power dynamic. And so in that sense, you know, things are not good all across the board. You know, I think it's horrifying that the government is collecting data on everybody everywhere all the time. By the same token, we're more aware of it and we can kind of push back or live our lives beyond that. It's really important, I think, part of uh, what I've called libertarianism 3.0 or kind of like the next st stage of libertarianism is to realize that if we spend all of our time focused on the government to the exclusion of getting on with our lives or enjoying anything, we've lost. You, if you become defined by that object which you hate, you're just as trapped. 
as a, so enjoy, you know, enjoy pork fest, enjoy the good weather, uh, and don't, you know, don't think about the government for the next five minutes if you can. But thank you. Yeah, hi. I was uh, born in Brooklyn and grew up in New Jersey, just like you. All so right, yes. It's, good, it's, good. it's a I'm toxic a, mix, <laughs> right? It's yes. getting worse and worse. And I, but, I mean, quite literally toxic, yeah, but yes. Yeah, just about everything about yeah. it. But um, um, I, I, I want to He's you only this. 14 years old, I just want to say. So. This is what smoking did to yeah, me, by the way. Yeah. But That's I want right. to ask you a question about the tobacco war and tobacco. But first, mm -hmm. real quick about the gay marriage. Um, you know, my understanding is that there was no such thing in America as a marriage license until after the Civil War, hmm. and and localities started um, coming up with marriage licenses yep. to keep whites from marrying newly freed blacks. And you yep. know, people really need to understand the context of where marriage licenses actually came into being. You know, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, mm. they did not even have marriage licenses. Yep. There was no such thing back then. But um, about the tobacco, you know, I make my own cigarettes and it used to be very cheap before this federal $25 pound excise tax yep. on loose tobacco, but I used to buy flavored tobacco and then mm -hmm. the government decided that that was gonna be too enticing for children, right. you know, fruit flavored tobacco, so they banned it. So, then I had to buy spray on, and it became too much effort. Now I just make them plain. But I'm, I was going to switch to vaping, and now all the, yeah. the, these Chuck Schumer types are all so busy trying to, you know, do what they can to, to stop vaping right. because children. And you, you mentioned the, uh, the the magnets, and uh, I see that the, an attempt here to infantile us to not let us have right. anything that isn't safe unless uh, right. children could do it. I was wondering if you could address that issue because no, I find a, it very disturbing. Yeah. You, know. you know, there's a great uh, blog and writer, thank you. Uh, and by the way, you know, you could always think about quitting smoking. I mean, I'm just throwing it out there because I care about you. Okay, no, no, but uh, this is, this is the, 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 the kind of mutations of the war on pleasure where it is, okay, well, you know, cigarettes are bad, you know, uh, yeah, okay, and you know, but people can still choose you know, they can say, okay, well, I want to smoke. I'm alive with pleasure when I'm smoking a cool, so go fuck yourself, right? Uh, but, or Newport, uh, excuse me. Uh, but, you know, but then it's like, okay, well, we can't do that, but you can't have flavored cigarettes or flavored cigars because kids might like them because kids like candy and they like putting lit things in their mouths. And then vaping, <laughs> most of the early pushback on vaping, so then, you know, finally you come up with a product that is non-toxic to the best of our knowledge, and, you know, there's going to be more and more research done on that. And then people are like, well, we got to get rid of it because it looks like smoking. And even though all of the evidence is that people go from smoking cigarettes, which is definitely harmful to your health, to vaping, which is not. And they're like, oh, we got to stop that because it might entice people to smoke and you can't have flavored, you know, you can't have banana flavored vaping uh, solution because then kids will want it. And, you know, this is the war on pleasure. It's always among us. Uh, and, you know, we think of the war on pleasure as like kind of fuss budget uh, Puritans from the colonial period or the 1950s, but it's everywhere around us. And now it's for uh, one of my uh, colleagues at, uh, at Reason, Jacob Solomon, wrote a book about the anti-smoking movement titled For Your Own Good. And that's, you know, it's for your own good. It's for your own good. And, you know, it's, this is a war that will never end, but, you know, vaping didn't exist 10 years ago. So it's there, and when they shut that down, somebody will come up with something else. And uh, although, and I was going to say, and then there's always uh, airplane glue, airplane model glue, but that's actually, you can't huff that anymore. They've changed that. So maybe I take it back, we are in a police state. <laughs> yeah. So I was wondering if you could talk on the comparison between sort of the old school method of social change through the political system mm -hmm. compared to a more new school method where you're using technologies like Bitcoin and Uber yep. to just create voluntary systems that replace the coercive ones because it's a better way to do I, it. Yeah, that's no, interesting. And I think, again, uh, you know, this Arthur E. Kirch guy who I mentioned, he died a few years ago, uh, but he wrote a book in the 50s and updated it in the 60s called The Decline of American Liberalism. Which, and by that he meant kind of a classical or European liberalism. Uh, and it's, you know, this idea of centralization versus decentralization, et cetera. It's like, it, it's, it's an evergreen because it's a dynamic that really is everywhere around us. Um, you know, old school political organizing or old school social change through political, uh, 
procedures is useful and is important, and we need that. We need that in all sorts of ways. And we also need to just get on with stuff that is enabled by technology, things like Uber, things like Lyft, uh, things like Bitcoin. And it's always going to be a combination. One of the great uh, things about American society, and I mean the country in certain ways was founded on this principle, and then it keeps enacting it, including things like the Free State Project, where you say, okay, you know what? I'm not going to spend my life fighting over, you know, getting a, a, a stop sign put up at this intersection. I'm going to move to a town and create a better way of living, and then people can learn from that. So it's a combination of these two things. And, that, you know, it's that mix that really changes things. I'm also Canadian, and Jeez. so I have a comment. You know, you didn't have to tell us that. It's kind of obvious. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, so my... By the way, right. uh, there is, you know, I mean, it, 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 no, no place is good or bad across the board. There's a very strong case that Canada is a far more libertarian country at this point than, than America. So let's, you know, let's keep that in mind before we invade it and take it over. So, yeah. Okay, so I have a comment and a question. Uh, my first comment was just to say thank you for sharing that meme uh, from, from Tim Owen. I, I was the first okay. one to share it on Twitter and it just oh, went yeah, yeah. crazy. Uh, my question is just to get your thoughts on open borders and how can, uh, well, um, if we can just put aside our, uh, uh, the U.S. difference of the uh, Mexicans, can yeah. we at least agree to tear down the borders? Yeah. I, I am uh, I'm a, a passionate defender, or, or uh, I'm not a particularly articulate advocate of open borders, but the, here's, uh, you know, one of the things that 9-11 uh, allowed, it was a pretext to make it harder to get in and out of the United States. I think that's a real tragedy. And uh, my grandparents, all four of my grandparents emigrated here. Uh, my, uh, my mother's parents were Italian, and she actually, my uh, Italian grandmother had one child, got homesick, went back to Italy, and then had to sit, at, you know, live in Italy for five to six years before she could get back into the country where her husband lived. Uh, you know, this is, that's what open borders would solve. You know, these kinds, because in the 20s, this was in the 20s, when the, you know, just openly racist ways of keeping out you know, garlic eating, uh, you know, uh, the fellaheen from the slums of Europe, uh, whether they were Jewish or, or Italian or Polish or whatever, come out, it's a bad thing. And, uh, you know, the, the, here's the upside of all of this, is that, you know, governments don't control borders. This is one of the great fictions uh, that, you know, somehow we're having an effect on the large volume of people crossing the Mexican border. Um, you know, in fact, the people who come here, they come here when the economy is good or when there are opportunities for them. They stop coming when their home country is doing well or those opportunities dry up. And if you look, according to the U.S. Uh, immigration numbers and things like that, uh, you know, Mexico, illegal entry, entrance by Mexicans slowed down when the economy slowed down. It picks up when it picks up. Immigration is never a problem. Uh, la lack of immigration is far more of a problem, I think, both culturally and economically. And this is a powerful message, by the way. You know, one of the things that libertarianism does is it scrambles existing categories. And immigration, I think, is one of the, the clearest cases of that. And I think if you believe in immigration, you know, it's a topic to talk a lot about with people that, you know, who are, who are conventional liberals or conventional conservatives because they need to understand that for the same reason that people should be allowed to move where they want, they should be allowed to live how they want when they get there. Yep. First, thanks for all your great work over the years. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, you mentioned uh, commercial surveillance mm -hmm. and I couldn't help but remember, uh, and this was like 10, 12 years ago, coming home from work one day, opening my mailbox, and there's a magazine that says, we know where you are, and yeah. my apartment building is circled yeah. on the picture, on the cover. <laughs> Freaked me right out. Yeah, we uh, reason, uh, this was, I edited the print magazine from 2000 to 2008, and then two, I think it was June 2004. We uh, managed to pull off a publishing first where we sent out about 45,000 uh, copies of the magazine to subscribers where we had, uh, come up with a computer program and used a, a kind of cutting edge printer to create personalized covers 
so that every subscriber got a picture of the house that, they li that the magazine was sent to, circled, saying, we know where you are, they know where you are. And we also had information that was tied on the f inside and back covers that was tied to your particular congressional district and zip code. Um, and you know, it was a lot of fun, and it was actually the story that that was about by Declan McCullough, who writes for CNET, was called The Upside of Zero Privacy. And that's, you know, the, like the upsides of a database nation. And among other things, you know, your mortgage, uh, because information about you is more widely shared now uh, among, you know, lenders and various other people, your mortgage is about 1% cheaper, uh, one percentage point cheaper than it would be otherwise. I mean, there are definite upsides. So a funny note on that before I'll go, and I think we should probably end it with this next question or comment. But... Um, you would not believe how many people canceled their subscription and they said, how <laughs> dare you, you know, you take a picture of our house. We used uh, a, a private service that does aerial photography and it's like, you know, we know where you live since you started subscribing to the magazine. Um, but, you know. We've had so many foreigners, foreigners up here, I feel like I should just be from someplace else. Is, should I make something up? Is that the idea? Sure, go ahead. Uh, from Antarctica, hey. Okay, yeah. Free State Project. Now, my question is about Public Law 62-5. Are you familiar with that? I'm sorry, say that again. 62-5, the public law that capped the number of people in the House of Representatives in the U.S. Congress. I did. I, no, I do not know that. Yeah, there's a law. And for the last hundred years, as far as I can tell, the math looks like the population's going oh, right. up, the numbers staying the same. So yeah. the U.S. has been growing less democratic That's right. for the last 100 years. There's a great book about that. And I mean, this is a basic point of, you know, we've had 435 members of Congress for a long time, even though the country is much bigger now. So each of those individual members of Congress actually has, you know, they are more powerful than they used to be. They get to call the shots for larger and larger numbers of people. So political power is, be, is centralized by m basic math. And it, there's a great book uh, whose name, I'm, uh, and I'm forgetting the title of it, by a guy named Arnold Kling, uh, who talks about this. And it's about the kind of paradox of the idea that everywhere in our lives, um, control of knowledge and of, uh, of kind of decision-making apparatus is decentralizing, but in the political sphere, it's, it's centralizing, and that's a real it's, interesting dichotomy. It's getting worse, and yep. it's going to continue to get worse unless we have like some massive disaster that's going to reduce our population substantially. What would that be? I don't see are anything. You, uh, are you, do you have a favored oh, uh, no. apocalyptic there, scenario? There's, there's so many yeah. things to choose from, okay. right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, no. Come on, Ebola, uh, yeah. Zombies are good. Uh, you know, infestation of rabbits. Uh, you know, I mean, we could go on and on. But well, um, I don't see anything about this in the press. I don't see, I don't see much about this in reason. Yeah. It'll occasionally get a citation, but it seems like a fundamental problem yeah. with, with, with our constitutional and less it's, democratic yeah, republic. It's, it's uh, you know, I appreciate you bringing it up, and, uh, and I'm not just saying this to get out of here and so that Joel Salatin can uh, uh, mesmerize us with his presentation, but I will actually raise that with, uh, with my staff because it is, if representative government is better than non-representative government, yeah, we should, we should engage that What's issue. the number now? About 500,000. I think Iceland's at 10,000. So people in yeah. Iceland are about 50 times as free as I am, yeah. or 50 times more voice in their government? Yeah, let's say they're 50,000 times or whatever more represented. <laughs> and also, by the way, the people in Iceland are better looking than we are. I just want to say that. I always knew that was okay. true. Uh, and, and, yeah, so. Can, can I make one more point? New Hampshire. I've, cap the number of their representatives at the same number as the U.S. House. And that's why we have good government here, because yeah. 3,000 people elect a representative, and if you don't like him, you can go to his house and throw rocks at it or, or tell right. him when you see him yeah. in Safeway. All right. That's why well, we have good government you. here. Let me, uh, because, I am, because I am, was born in Brooklyn and I was raised in New Jersey, and I'm half Irish and half Italian, so I'm a double genetic loser, and a malcontent. Let me just end my comments by dissing New Hampshire. If this state is so fucking free, why do you have to go to a state liquor store? Yeah. Okay? And until you guys crack that nut, you know, uh, like I think you, can, you should walk a little bit more slouched than you are. But I will, thank you, thank you for raising those points. Thank you, Carla, thank you, Jason, thank you, you people. Uh, for everything and uh, thank you.